Today, I'm talking about geopolitical game theory and Bitcoin. It turns out FOMO doesn't just operate at the individual level or even at the corporate level, but also at the sovereign nation state level. Let's jump into it. Welcome back to another video. My name is Ian Major. I'm an entrepreneur, Bitcoin pleb, and all around raging capitalist. And in today's video, I'm going to go through some of the most recent um, just sort of musings from governments and intra-governmental agencies, what they're saying about Bitcoin, especially on uh, the eve, I guess by the time this video goes out, uh, we will have just seen the official commencement of Bitcoin as legal tender in El Salvador on September 7th. Uh, and so that is very interesting. Um, and I want to just talk about uh, a couple theories on how this will play out at the sort of sovereign nation state level, um, because that's an important part of the big picture of Bitcoin. Um, for those returning to the channel, welcome back, my friends and fellow raging capitalists. As always, it is great to have you. And for those new to the channel, I welcome you as well. I know there are many of you, over 80% of you right now watching at this very moment are not subscribed. And so if you like this content, I invite you to subscribe and join us on our merry gang in cyberspace. I cover all manner of Bitcoin related content, including uh, kind of news and analysis like this, as well as wallet tutorials, technology, latest developments, and more. So you won't want to miss a thing. With all that out of the way, though, let's go ahead and jump into some of the recent headlines. Into this, um, I mean, the first thing is if you type in just El Salvador, right? The top stories are, uh, you know, protests over Bitcoin law, skepticism growing, uh, you know, anti-Bitcoin protests. So mainstream media is absolutely all over it, doing everything they can to undermine, uh, you know, what's happening in El Salvador. Uh, to be clear, as always, I am personally against legal tender laws. I don't think any government should tell its citizens uh, what forms of money they can and can't use. But that is beside the point. Uh, this is clearly an attack on, uh, on El Salvador and Bitcoin um, and the credibility there for this decision. Uh, the IMF came out with uh, this particular tweet, privately issued crypto assets like Bitcoin come with substantial risks. Making them equivalent to a national currency is an inadvisable shortcut. Read more. I mean, for one, privately issued doesn't make any sense. Bitcoin is a public blockchain, uh, but the IMF wouldn't, uh, wouldn't know that and wouldn't care. Uh, if we click on this link and go to the um, actual blog post, it is pretty, pretty amusing. Um, they attempt to provide what they probably feel is a very balanced and, um, you know, uh, rational view of this. But, you know, they base, it's basically just a list of FUD. Uh, Bitcoin is volatile, um, you know, uh, reached a peak, less than, you know, cut, cut its value in half, and yet it lives on for some reason. And so, you know, they make some valid points, right? If um, a crypto asset were, were granted legal tender status, it would have to be accepted by, uh, you know, all these sort of different participants. And, and that is true, right? It's not to say that, um, you know, this would just sort of happen. But, you know, they also say some pretty hilarious things, um, such as this one. Crypto assets are unlikely to catch on in countries with stable inflation and exchange rates and credible institutions. Where is such a country? I would love to know. Uh, I'm unaware of any country that meets that criteria. Um, if you want to argue that five plus percent inflation is stable, then then fine. Um, but no country has any credible institutions, certainly not the U.S. And so their message here is proceed with caution. Uh, it could create as you know macroeconomic instability. Um, prices could become highly unstable. Financial integrity could suffer, right? We need anti-money laundering. We need to combat all the financial terrorism that is happening in Bitcoin um, because less than, far less than 1% of all transactions have to do with that versus 6 to 7% uh, in the fiat world. Ooh, furthermore, it, widespread crypto asset use would undermine consumer protection. The IMF is so, so nice. They're just looking out for you. Um, make no mistake, the IMF is an absolutely insidious entity 
created at the uh, as part of the Bretton Woods um, agreement in 1944-45, um, and and really like if you're curious for how they work, um, I'll link this Investopedia article. I mean Investopedia, but it has you know a good little rundown. And basically, how this works is um, different member states will uh, contribute a quota, so they'll pay the IMF. Um, every year in proportion to the size of their uh, economy. And in return for that, they get voting rights. They get commensurate voting rights. Uh, by the way, sounds an awful lot like proof of stake. Um, so, you know, not surprisingly, the U.S. pays the most, uh, etc. And what happens is, you know, the, the, the supposed purpose for the IMF is to provide um, financial assistance and expertise to nations that uh, are struggling with some sort of a crisis. Um, you know, they leave out the fact that that crisis is probably because of uh, the current dollar hegemony uh, run by the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency for the world. But that's beside the point. Um, the really kind of insidious part here is the, uh, the way they apply these structural adjustment programs. And so, um, you know, what this basically means is in exchange for financial help, that the countries have to pay back, right? So this is not a you know charity. Um, a country will have to go through what is what is called a structural adjustment program, and this is basically just whatever arbitrary set of things that the IMF feels is appropriate for that nation. Um, so you know we're not even talking about individual sovereignty. We're talking about the sovereignty of an entire group of people that's just sort of arbitrarily decided. Uh, and, you know, they'll dress it up and they'll say, well, we're trying to get them to um, f- reform their economy in a way that will provide sustainable growth, etc. Uh, but make no mistake, this is very simply a way for the broader powers that be uh, to retain control over um, emerging nations. And so it is insidious. Um, you also have a increasing cry coming out of China Bitcoin has no value. People banks, uh, people's uh, banks of China, pe- I think people's bank of China official announces further crackdown. Uh, they say it has no value, no value support, uh, blah, 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 blah. So we're just going to see more and more and more of this um, as we get deeper into things. No government and certainly no intra-government agency such as the IMF is ever going to voluntarily relinquish power. And that is exactly what adoption of Bitcoin means for them. So make no mistake, when you see these headlines and when you see them really pump around things like the official um, commencement of Bitcoin as legal tender in El Salvador, that is um, the narrative that they're trying to create, that you know Bitcoin is very dangerous, uh, it's very volatile, which is true, but they completely leave out the context around its potential benefits in freeing citizens around the world to become financially sovereign and avoid having their savings melt like an ice cube in their traditional bank accounts. But with all of that out of the way, you know, you may think to yourself, oh, governments really are going to kind of push the pedal hard to try and stop this thing. And I think that's true. But there's another side of this coin, and it has to do with Bitcoin's inexorable game theory. And so let's now talk through that and a couple theories for how this could play out. All right, so for those unfamiliar with game theory, it's basically the idea that um, there is a strategic element in terms of taking action, right? We don't take action in a vacuum. Um, There are competitors or other entities in the ecosystem in which we're operating that may take responsive action um, against the action that we initiate uh, or vice versa, right? And so let's just visualize what that looks like in terms of Bitcoin uh, and nations using our handy matrix. So as you can see here, nation A is along the top and nation B is along the side and they each have a choice of buying or not buying Bitcoin. Um, And so this would be something like putting Bitcoin on their central bank balance sheet, for example. Um, And so let's just walk through the different quadrants. Quadrant one at the top, well, left, that's not quadrant one mathematically, uh, you have don't buy and don't buy, right? And so 
you would basically have a wash. You know, central banking is unaffected. Nothing, nothing happens there. Um, let's go to scenario two, where nation A buys and nation B doesn't. Nation A buys early and therefore gets rich. Um, because as we've seen so many times, Bitcoin is this inexorable emergent monetary network that will not be stopped. Uh, B is therefore a late adopter and will be on a relative basis worse off than nation A. Uh, let's do the flip of that and go down to scenario three where nation B buys and nation A doesn't. It's, it's just the opposite of what we just discussed. Um, the early mover would have the advantage and the later adopter would be relatively worse off especially when you consider the fact that any of these governments could just print a bunch of money and buy a bunch of Bitcoin right now. Um, and that's probably happening and you know we just don't know it yet. Uh, scenario four is where they both buy, right? They both become early adopters, uh, but essentially give up their monopoly on money. So this is the kind of vicious game theory that is going to play out. El Salvador was an early adopter. Um, now, I don't believe I've seen any news about them actually putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Um, rather, they are making it legal tender. Uh, but I imagine that that would come and I, I think they have provisions on what that would look like. Um, so, you know, just think about the FOMO that we've probably all experienced one time or another, even if we're uh, stalwart, you know, stone cold, ice in the vein hodlers, like we've probably all felt that you know, FOMO of like, well, screw it. I'm going to deviate from my dollar cost averaging plan. And instead of buying X per week, I'm just going to, you know, YOLO into this. And so think of how that operates at a nation state level. And this becomes critical, especially with the levels of debt that we see in the world today. Um, we are at what one might call the top of a 100 plus year sovereign debt cycle, right? Um, you know, those of you who have seen Ray Dalio's sort of long term debt cycle, uh, this is sort of equivalent to that. And so you think about how a lot of nations have their backs against the wall, like they're going to really need to pull some tricks out of their sleeve to make all this work. I mean, the U.S. to make the debt more palatable. I mean, they're going to have to inflate away um, the debt. Like, there, there's no other way out of it. They could, they could let the whole house of cards collapse and usher in something that would be worse than the Great Depression. But like, no one's going to do that on their watch. We've seen the can be kicked far too many times, and so governments are running out of options. And it's very clear that the marginal effectiveness of techniques like QE are sort of losing their impactfulness. So it remains to be seen. I mean, think of also like the personal level of this, you know, think of when, I mean, in the US right now today, I think you have upwards of 20 plus percent of uh, US adults that own some amount of Bitcoin. Um, that starts to get pretty sizable and you start to get politicians who have bought some Bitcoin. Uh, and, right, and so those politicians aren't about to vote against something that could harm their their family and their self uh, and and net worth, and so you start to see all these ways that Bitcoin sucks people and entities and groups of people into its black hole um, that will lead to very interesting behavior. So my bet is that we will continue to see more nations um, uh, implementing. You know a bitcoin kind of buy plan onto their balance sheets they're probably going to do that in stealth mode for as long as they can so that their imf overlords don't uh take notice or you know whatever um and we'll probably see more nations also adopt bitcoin as legal tender there's another and i think even deeper and more interesting uh theory that has to do with the us specifically a lot of those out there say, well, yeah, China's, you know, banned it effectively, but like 
that's China. You know, of course, they're going to ban anything that gives them less control uh, over their their people. Right. Um, it's a completely authoritarian authoritarian regime. But like once the U.S. bans it, then the world is really going to be, you know, it's really going to take a hit to Bitcoin, whatever. Um, as I just said, the adoption level in the U.S. is already high enough to where that would be extremely politically un, unfavorable. Um, despite what we saw with the infrastructure bill um, and that reaching a not particularly satisfactory conclusion, uh, in terms of the political process around Bitcoin, uh, you still saw the ferocity with which the industry sort of pounced on uh, political leaders, and um, and it, it 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 at least moved the needle. So based on that alone, we could probably make a pretty sound, you know, rationale that the U.S. is never going to outright ban Bitcoin. They're just rather going to try and impede its progress and uh, tax it and regulate it, etc. But there's an even stronger form of that hypothesis that says Bitcoin is a literal matter of national security for the U.S. What do I mean by that? So it's no secret that the U.S. dollar is losing its dominance, its sheer dominance on the global stage. Um, you know, the percentage of dollars held in foreign reserves has gone down. And what you're seeing instead of that is a rise of the Chinese yuan. Um, there was this interesting study done um, by a London-based think tank, and it showed that 30% of central banks plan to increase their yuan holdings over the next 12 to 24 months. That compares with just 10% last year. And in contrast to that, 20% of central banks plan to reduce their holdings of the U.S. dollar. Uh, and 18% plan to reduce their euro holdings. So we are seeing this very interesting, um, you know, dynamic develop. Like you would naturally expect a reserve currency to um, to be commensurate with the with trade, right? Like if I'm the biggest trading partner in the world, it makes sense that my currency uh, is a more appropriate reserve currency than others. And so the U.S. as as China has continued its climb in terms of, um, you know, uh, and you know being an export nation and um, exporting you know all these goods to the U.S. and many many other countries around the world, uh, you're more and more seeing the use of the yuan. You're also seeing some very interesting dynamics in energy pricing. So Russia is already selling energy you know, oil, et cetera, to China denominated in yuan. The whole agreement of, um, you know, Bretton Woods and then the sort of petrodollar system that kicked in after Nixon severed the, the link of the dollar to gold, like the whole thing, the whole agreement, the entire paradigm of the monetary system in which we live and in which we have lived since 1971 is this petrodollar system in which the U.S. basically says, hey, Saudi and other energy producers, you need to price energy in dollar terms. In exchange for that, we will use our mighty navy to, um, you know, to shepherd your oil tankers to the various places they have to go. So we will provide protection and you will denominate energy uh, pricing in dollars. We are already seeing perhaps not surprisingly, a pair like Russia and China deviate from that agreement. Um, you know, Russia is settling lots of stuff in gold now, uh, as well as the yuan, as well as um, euros. And you've now seen longtime sort of ally, quasi ally maybe, um, Saudi Arabia, uh, start to move towards what appears to be a world in which they sell energy to China uh, denominated in yuan. Um, and it sort of makes sense. China is now their largest client. The U.S. no longer is. Uh, and China imports more energy from Saudi than the U.S. does. So we're seeing this very interesting move uh, away from the dollar bit by bit. I'm not saying that even in the next decade, the U.S. dollar will truly lose its reserves uh, currency status. Although it could, like that possibility, I think, is now on the table. 
Um, and you also see the entire dollar system and hegemony being used against the national security interests of the U.S. What do I mean by that? China can basically bankroll any number of financing deals to emerging nations. For example, let's say that um, you know a country in East, in East Africa uh, needs financing to complete a critical infrastructure project. You know, they're building a massive new power plant that will provide energy for many of their citizens. China comes in and says, hey, we'll bankroll that for you. We'll provide the financing and we'll do it in dollars. But the terms of that deal are that if you're unable to pay back, if the, if the country is unable to pay back the debt, then China will get hard assets. China will get the hard assets as collateral. So that could include land. It could include resources, etc. If the dollar strengthens, it makes it more likely that foreign nations won't be able to pay back the dollar denominated debt to China, um, in which case, even if that were to occur, China gets the hard collateral. So if they do pay the debt back, China makes a spread on these financing deals. So this is part of their One Belt and Road initiative, right? Uh, and if, if you know they default on that, loan, then China gets hard assets. So China basically wins either way with these financing deals. And so all of this leads me to say that there's a very interesting theory going around, which is that if pressed for it, the U.S. would absolutely choose a neutral settlement asset like Bitcoin or like gold um, versus something like the Yuan or the digital version of the Chinese Yuan uh, that we've seen a lot of headlines around. Very, very interesting to think about, right? And I'm not so sure what is uh, what is right, but suffice it to say that there are dynamics now that you can bet the U.S. De- you know Secretary of Defense, Defense Department, like this is now a matter of national security. At least the the sort of confrontation with China uh, on this kind of global uh, stage. And it would only reason that something neutral would be preferred to the, the digital yuan. Um, and maybe, maybe this is why, uh, despite all the back and forth as part of that crypto tax provision in the infrastructure bill, it was interesting to a lot of observers that Bitcoin seemed to be in its own little like category, like no matter what the amendment was, and um, you know, Bic- like Bitcoin, right? You had a number of amendment uh, prop- proposals that specifically excluded Bitcoin mining, and like, why is that? You know, isn't the government about climate and energy and green and all this stuff? And like, you know, it's one of its central pieces of fud is the energy debate that Bitcoin's very. Uh, you know, it's, it's not green and it uses a lot of energy. And yet you you weirdly saw all these political figures kind of rally behind like, oh, yeah, no, no, no. We don't want to mess with, you know, Bitcoin miners. Interesting stuff. It makes you think. Um, so those are just a couple of kind of theories I wanted to throw out in this video. Uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up and conclude for today. All right, so there you have it, gang. Um, Just to recap, my purpose and goal for this video was to encourage you to think deeper beyond the headlines of, oh, governments will ban Bitcoin, you know, blah, 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 right? Like there is a much deeper game theory dynamic going on here, Um, whether you consider the fact that politicians will ultimately have Bitcoin on their personal balance sheets and are not going to do anything to... Uh, proactively, um, you know, destroy that for them and their families. Uh, You're going to progressively see more nations putting Bitcoin on their actual balance sheet, uh, as we saw through that kind of trade-off matrix. Um, And lastly, there's this very interesting sort of narrative and theory for now around the U.S. and its national security interests as it relates to preferring a neutral settlement asset like Bitcoin versus uh, something like the digital yuan. So it remains to be seen how all this plays out, uh, but I hope this encourages you to think deeper uh, and and really think critically about this sort of 
game theory that sucks entities into uh, in, into Bitcoin. I hope you found this valuable and useful. If you did, you already know what to do. Give this video a like. Comment down below. I want to hear what you think. You know, what are your thoughts on any of these theories? Um, what are theories of your own? What topics would you like to see future videos on? I really do take that into account when making the schedule for the channel. But for now, we're going to go ahead and leave this video here. As always, every sack counts. And until next time, I'll see you then.